Released in 1997, The Devil's Advocate tells the story of Florida-based lawyer Kevin Lomax, played by Keanu Reeves, a young hotshot who has never lost a case, despite the fact that some of his clients are true scumbags. Due to his success, Kevin is invited to join a big-time New York lawyer firm led by John Milton, played devilishly by Al Pacino. Kevin and his wife, Mary Ann, played by Charlie Theron, make the move from Florida to New York, but their married life quickly is turned upside down, as Mary Ann frequently gets terrorized with sinister demonic visions and basically has a nervous breakdown, where Kevin increasingly gets gripped down by the immoral temptation and power and charm of John Milton. In this supernatural thriller in which Al Pacino totally steals the show thanks to his sharp, witty dialogue and sometimes loud, bombastic delivery of lines. Yeah, to me, thanks to Pacino, The Devil's Advocate could have been a, yeah, that's all right kind of movie, but actually becomes a much more epic and memorable one thanks to his performance. In fact, as far as being awesomely over the top goes, I would say that his performance in The Devil's Advocate is right up there with Scarface. So let's look into 10 things that you didn't know about The Devil's Advocate. Let's open up the forbidden book and check it out. Number 10, based on a book. The Devil's Advocate is actually based on a novel of the same name by American author Andrew Niederman. The book was published in 1990, and it has the same bare basic premise of the movie, in that it's about a young lawyer, who in the book is not called Kevin Lomax, but Kevin Taylor, who joins a New York firm thinking that he's hit the big time, only to see the true evil of the firm after he joins it, where evil criminals walk free, with the firm being run by the devil himself. One user on Google Reads describes it as being, quote, the firm meets Rosemary's baby, of which I couldn't have said it better myself. But other than that, the book and film are actually totally different, as there are tons of changes between the book and movie, namely the endings. Unlike the movie where Kevin Lomax sacrifices himself only to return at the start of the movie, giving him a second chance, in the book, Kevin Taylor actually kills the devil instead, aka John Milton, where he is charged with murder and sentenced to life imprisonment, giving it more of a dark, bleak ending. And I think that The Devil's Advocate is one of those rare occasions when a movie is actually better than the book that it's based off. Number 9. At one stage, Joel Schumacher was going to direct. In the early 90s, Andrew Niederman pitched his novel to Warner Brothers, and they were interested, so they brought the rights to the story of The Devil's Advocate to turn into a movie. So none other than Joel Schumacher came on board. Now, before you shrug this off and think, oh yeah, the guy who gave us bat nipples, just remember this would have been at a time when he had just previously given us the Lost Boys, Flatliners, and possibly Fallen Down. So he would have been perfect for The Devil's Advocate. Brad Pitt was cast as Kevin, and this version of the movie would have featured a scene where the New York subway system turns out to be the circles of hell. This version of The Devil's Advocate was actually more special effects heavy and described as being more of a Hollywood movie. So why did this version of The Devil's Advocate never happen? Well, simply put, Schumacher just couldn't find someone to play the role of the devil, and thus the project was abandoned. But no doubt there is a pocket reality where Joel Schumacher's special effects heavy Devil's Advocate starring Brad Pitt exists. Number 8. A real life court case got the project back on track. So as mentioned, The Devil's Advocate under the helm of Joel Schumacher saw the project shelved. However, it was a real-life notorious court case that got Warner Brothers interested in The Devil's Advocate again, and that was the O.J. Simpson trial. Yep, the notorious trial that got everyone talking during the mid-90s. In fact, this case was so huge, the whole world was glued to their TV screens to see what revelations may come out next, as well as seeing what the final verdict will be. Given that a huge part of The Devil's Advocate is about courtroom politics and criminal trials, Warner Brothers saw potential in capitalizing on the public's newfound interest in criminal court cases. Director Taylor Hackford came on board as the movie's director. 
Hackford had previously directed An Officer and a Gentleman, as well as Dolores Claiborne, and would go on to direct the bio-epic Ray. Hackford wanted rewrites made to the script to make The Devil's Advocate feel more grounded in reality, and hired Tony Gilroy to rework the movie. Gilroy would go on to write the Jason Bourne movies and Rogue One. And what with all these new rewrites taking place, Hackford and Gilroy added the subplot of Kevin turning out to be Milton's son. Another revelation that wasn't in the book, but was purely created for the movie. Number 7. Casting Al Pacino had been offered the role of Milton several times, but kept turning the role down. He found the part to be too cliché. He pretty much said, no thank you, try Sean Connery or Robert Redford instead. However, after several rewrites, he did become more interested in the role and accepted it. And in order to prepare for the part, he watched the 1941 movie, The Devil and Daniel Webster. Keanu Reeves turned down starring in Speed 2 to star in The Devil's Advocate instead, despite Speed 2's production offering him a higher fee of $11 million. In fact, Reeves actually took quite a pay cut compared to what he usually gets paid, just so the production could hire Al Pacino. Because if you have the opportunity to work with the great Al Pacino, then you take that opportunity. Now, you may be thinking that Reeves chose The Devil's Advocate over Speed 2, as he saw how awful the script was for Speed 2 and didn't want a bar of it. Well, no. The real reason is because he had just starred in the movie Chain Reaction, and he didn't want to star in two action movies in a row. That is one bizarre and random reason which stopped Keanu Reeves from starring in an awful movie to starring in an awesome one. Number 6. Makeup Effects Wizard The makeup effects for the movie were created by movie makeup legend Rick Baker, who previously provided the makeup effects for An American Werewolf in London and Coming to America. And the very same year The Devil's Advocate came out, he also provided many of the aliens seen in Men in Black. Baker was responsible for adding the demonic looking faces to the human characters, and his work in The Devil's Advocate does look more digital than his usual work. However, there was one special effects scene that was quite intricate. It's the scene where at the end of the movie when Al Pacino morphs into a younger Keanu Reeves, which even today is still a pretty good effect. However, in between being 1997 Al Pacino and Keanu Reeves, for a brief second, we see a much younger Al Pacino. This was actually Pacino's likeness from the 1973 movie, The Godfather. And in order to achieve this effect, molds of Pacino's face from The Godfather were provided by Dick Smith, who did the makeup effects for the classic Mafia movie. He sent them to Baker for the transition scene of Pacino becoming a younger Keanu Reeves. So for that split second, you are literally seeing Pacino from The Godfather. Yep, all that work just for that one blink and you'll miss it moment. In addition to that, here are some clay molds that Baker created for The Devil's Advocate. And some of these I don't even think were used in the film, which is a shame as some of them look truly creepy. Ew, that's some nightmare fuel. Number 5. The Music of the Devil's Advocate The music of the Devil's Advocate was scored by James Newton Howard, whom had already scored several movies for director Taylor Hackford. The score he gives the Devil's Advocate is a really somber and creepy one. It's subtle yet also otherworldly, and it definitely complements the movie nicely. Howard has a huge filmography of movies he has scored, as his career really took off in the 90s, with him composing movies like Pretty Woman, The Fugitive, Waterworld, and Space Jam, and many, many more. He seemed to be the go-to guy for comedy and suspense. Since The Devil's Advocate, he has also scored The Sixth Sense and the Christopher Nolan Dark Knight trilogy. Interestingly, The Devil's Advocate ends with the Rolling Stones' 1966 song, Paint It Black. The irony is, the following year, Warner Brothers released another supernatural thriller called Fallen, which starred the great Denzel Washington. And it also had very similar themes and ideas to The Devil's Advocate, and even looks similar, as in they both look like they are set in the same universe. And Fallen also features a classic Rolling Stones song. In this case, it's Time Is On My Side. In fact, I can remember buying The Devil's Advocate on VHS when I was a kid, and it actually came in a double feature box set with Fallen. Number 4. Awards 
There have been many movie portrayals of the devil over the years, from Jack Nicholson to Elizabeth Hurley, and Tim Curry to Robert De Niro. It seems that everyone has their own favorite cinematic version of the Dark Lord of Evil. And it also seems that back in 1997, people just couldn't get enough of Al Pacino's take on the horned overlord. As many have said, his powerful performance and dialogue is a highlight of the movie, with his performance even being labeled as delicious. In fact, Pacino was so embraced in The Devil's Advocate, he was even nominated for an MTV Award for Best Villain in a Movie, but instead lost to Mike Myers' Dr. Evil in Austin Powers' International Man of Mystery. Still, not bad when you think about it, considering he originally didn't want to star in The Devil's Advocate and apparently had to be asked five times. The movie did, however, win a Saturn Award for Best Horror Film. Number 3. Prequel and Musical In 2014, The Devil's Advocate's author, Andrew Niederman, wrote a prequel novel to The Devil's Advocate called Judgment Day, which focuses on the younger years of John Milton and his rise to power as a big-time New York attorney, as the story sees the fallen angel arriving in New York and gaining control of the law firm. Niederman took the novel to Warner Brothers Television with the hopes of it being adapted into a TV series, where the project was taken to NBC for a TV pilot to be written. But as of yet, nothing seems to have come of it. Also in 2014, there was a musical stage show version of The Devil's Advocate, because of course there was, which opened up at the West End Theatre, featuring music written by David Yazbek, who also worked on the Full Monty musical. But this is according to Wikipedia, and I couldn't find any other information about the musical, so who knows? If anyone knows different, do let me know. Number two, artwork lawsuit. A lawsuit took place after the release of The Devil's Advocate on the account of a sculpture seen in Milton's apartment featuring sculptured human forms, of which in the movie's climax comes alive. Sculpture Frederick Hart claimed that it was based off a sculpture that he had created for the National Cathedral in Washington, DC, and that his work was reimagined without his permission. Warner Brothers claimed that when the sculpture for The Devil's Advocate was created, it was done so without knowledge of Hart's sculpture, meaning the whole thing was just a coincidence. A judge ruled that The Devil's Advocate's home media release had to be put on hold while the case was being resolved. So in order for The Devil's Advocate to be released commercially on home video, Warner Brothers had to edit the sculpture, to which, in a later cut, the infamous sculpture then looked like this along with a sticker on the cover saying that there is no connection between the sculpture seen in the movie and Hart's real life sculpture. Even the poster had to be slightly modified, as in the background of the main poster, you can kind of make out the statue in the background. And after the court case, they had to make the visual more blurry so it couldn't really be made out at all. Heck, in Australia, we got new artwork for the VHS cover entirely. However, for some strange reason, the sculpture with all its moving bodies was allowed to stay the same for the movie's ending, which doesn't make sense as for the rest of the movie, the sculpture looks like this. Yep, Hollywood is weirdy weirdy woo-woos. Number one, The Devil's Release. The Devil's Advocate was released in October 1997, despite the studio originally wanting to release the movie in August. And it was a fairly successful hit, making $153 million on a $57 million budget. It had competition too, as it was released the same day as the teenage horror movie I Know What You Did Last Summer. I Know What You Did Last Summer performed better in the US box office market, but The Devil's Advocate still outnumbered I Know What You Did Last Summer in its worldwide performance. After Scream, it seemed that there was a sudden boom in teenage slasher movies, whereas The Devil's Advocate was mainly aimed at a 30-plus audience, and didn't feature scenes of teenagers running around getting killed, but instead courtroom cases. But despite this, it still performed pretty well. The movie got average to positive reviews, with it being said that the movie is entertaining, along with Pacino's performance. But some say that it never reached its full potential, and can often not be very engaging. But overall, it seemed that no one had any major issues with the movie. In 2014, Yahoo labelled The Devil's Advocate as being Pacino's most underrated movie. And yeah, I think I kind of agree with that, as it doesn't get anywhere near as much recognition as, say, The Godfather or Scarface. So, to conclude, The Devil's Advocate is a creepy and haunting story. And it's definitely worth going back and checking out again. 
It confronts us with many disturbing scenarios, as The Devil's Advocate shows us what happens when we leave behind morality and bite into the forbidden fruit of power and corruption. The 90s had many great supernatural thrillers grounded in a bleak reality, like Jacob's Ladder and The Sixth Sense. And if you're a fan of those movies, then you should definitely check out The Devil's Advocate. It sits in nicely with that genre. But above all, it's worth watching for Al Pacino's performance alone. I mean, think about it. It's a movie where the devil is a lawyer and is played by Al Pacino. That's a movie premise right there. Anyway, I'm Minty. And remember, look but don't touch. Touch but don't taste. Taste but don't swallow. See ya. Thank <laughs> you.